I'd like to ask Russ Martin from the Governor's Highway Safety Association to come up and talk about the response from the state highway safety offices. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, my name is Russ Martin. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Government Relations at the Governor's Highway Safety Association. Jonathan gave a little bit of an intro earlier, but we're the Association of State and Territorial Highway Safety Offices. All of our members receive grants from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to do behavioral highway safety work. And because impaired driving is probably the number one behavioral safety issue, all states have major impaired driving programs that address that issue in various different ways. Our last report on impaired driving was high-risk impaired drivers combating a critical threat. And this report touched on a lot of the issues that some of these earlier speakers described. It's like we need to start implementing countermeasures in a more strategic way that addresses the underlying problems that we begin to see. We need to have tools that we can use to classify offenders by risk. And I want to stress that the point of this is not of the report and this approach is not to uh, pour all of our efforts into the highest risk impaired driver because all impaired driving is important, even first time offenses, but we need to get the tools in place so that we can stratify and, and categorize offenders and apply that individualized approach that we think is really the most holistic way to address impaired driving. Because we have this legacy tough on impaired driving approach that we've probably been deploying for the last couple of decades, but we know that it's not perfect. Uh, even though it seems tough and certainly plays well politically, uh, there are some gaps in there. So we're going to spend a lot of time during this meeting talking about individual approaches to the issue, new technologies, new kinds of programs, new kinds of approaches. But uh, I want to make sure that we're also talking about the big picture. And it sounds like the NACID strategy does that. And when we think about countermeasures, they all go through a sort of a similar cycle of adoption. You have legacy countermeasures, things that we've been doing for a really long time. We know they work to a certain extent, but then cracks emerge, loopholes emerge. New unproven countermeasures come up, and this is a way to fill that, that gap or to address some sort of emerging issue. But often, there's little to no evaluation data. In the common scenarios, you have this sort of small individual evangelist saying, we have a solution to your problem. Why won't everyone adopt this new, this new solution? So if everything goes right, <clears throat> we move to small-scale demonstration programs. We begin to figure out how to, how to implement this program, how to get it out there into communities, and start to show that it really works. And then the next step is to scale it up to large scale deployment. Usually this is where the cost barriers emerge, but if you can break through that, you get a widely deployed program. Implementation becomes pretty standardized. You usually get some access to federal funding, which opens a lot of doors. You get the rigorous evaluation or steps towards research and data that helps to show how effective it is and eventually it becomes legacy and the cycle begins again. Most of the alcohol only world lives at the top of the cycle. And I know not all of it, there are some things that, that we're still working on, but a lot of things we're talking about in this meeting are still at the bottom of the scale. So I think strategically, it may be helpful for us to talk about how we can get all that stuff from the bottom of the cycle up to the top of the cycle. There are lots of barriers to implementing programs. One of the biggest ones is cost. Some of the things we're talking about like new specialized UI courts sophisticated toxicology equipment, any program where it's the idea is like, okay, we're gonna give every police officer X, whatever X might be. Whenever we talk about traffic records and data, which have all become basically government IT projects, all this stuff is, can be really expensive. It can be a lot more complex than a lot of the legacy countermeasure strategies that we've used, such as just enforcement mobilizations or ad buys. Um, state and local interagency cooperation. So states have to work with other state agencies. State highway safety offices have to work with other state agencies. They have to work with local agencies. And even though they have grant, re grant relationships, that only gets you so far. And sometimes it's actually really hard to get agencies to work together, even if you're working on the common goal of preventing impaired driving. And those of you who in state government can probably uh, all tell stories about that. Federal funding, so whenever states have to, uh, whenever states spend federal funding on highway safety, they have to justify that expenditure. Um, sometimes this is really, really difficult to do if you have something that's brand new, where there's not a lot of data or research behind it. Sometimes it's ambiguous whether or not uh, the use of federal funding is authorized in the, state, in the federal law. Um, these are issues where we work through, but, uh, but they are definitely barriers. Um, lack of research and data, showing that these things are really effective. Conducting that rigorous evaluation is a really helpful step. Um, and there are a lot of issues related to public opinion, and we're gonna talk a lot about that, I think, in a, in a segment that's coming up later in the meeting, but we have issues related to um, 
marijuana suddenly being legalized and you have this, this marijuana industry that's emerged, but we have a lot of folks in our community that, are, that are, have, have a law enforcement or criminal justice background, they probably have strong feelings about whether marijuana ought to be legalized or not. So um, is there a, a, a desire to work with those communities or how, do, how what are the perceptions? So we gotta work through that. I wanna mention, um, uh, I would be remiss not to mention a challenge we face in equity in traffic safety and highway safety. It's a big public opinion issue. There's a lot of people out there that are saying, we don't want traffic enforcement. We don't need traffic enforcement anymore. We're gonna build a way out of this problem. Now, there are some highway safety issues that are responsive to infrastructure. Uh, I'm looking at you speeding, um, pedestrian safety. And uh, if there was something that we could put into the built environment that would prevent a crash from happening or prevent a traffic stop from having to happen, I'm sure we'd be all for it. But I don't know if impaired driving fits that, that scenario. Um, I'm not sure what we can build that can prevent a lot of the, uh, the, the repeat impaired, impaired driving offenses that we're facing today. So this is not, also this is not an abstract discussion either. There are partners, some of them are in this room, some of them that I've spoken to that are out there trying to pass new safety laws or make even minor non-controversial improvements to existing safety laws. They're running into barriers because of equity concerns. We had a member come to us last summer in the heat of this equity discussion and tell us they had to go to their higher ups and explain to them why they can't just cancel traffic safety enforcement you know, for the rest of the year. We have a member that is struggling to make sure that behavioral safety remains in their strategic highway safety plan for the next five years, or whatever period of time is. Um, these are real issues that I think we need to address, challenges, but also opportunities. So if we're gonna have a strategy to address Impaired driving, um, there are a number of different solutions we should consider. I think more resources for impaired driving or more resources for highway safety overall. Um, thinking on the federal side of things, uh, you ask anyone in transportation, uh, national transportation, what is your number one priority? I think to a person, they'd probably all say safety. If you look at the budget, it tells a much different story. Um, right now, the situation we're working under out of all highway trust fund expenditures, I think it's 5% of all of those expenditures go to federal safety programs. That includes infrastructure, it's not just behavior. So I don't think the investment is where we want it to be. And I think that relates more to, maybe we ought to talk about how within our strategy, we can better make, make a, this issue more of a political priority because you get <clears throat> federal policymakers behind you, you get those leaders behind you and the rest will follow, the funding the research, the planning. We wouldn't have to organize a meeting like this uh, because we probably have someone at USDUT helping us to do it uh, uh, in addition. GHSA is always working to see how we can reform federal, uh, federal policy, um, but also state policy to remove barriers to implementing programs. I mentioned the, the research and funding piece. And then finally, coordinated public issue management that goes back to the public opinion piece. Equity. I think that uh, everyone in the room who has a part this issue essentially has a role to play in equity. And not, that's not just looking at your own program to see how can we think, make things more equitable and improve access and uh, diversity and representation and engagement. It also goes back to how all of us can help to tell a better story about why these programs are important, why the work that we, do, that we are doing is important to help save lives out there in the community. So I think we want to move to a world where, a uh, move away from a world where uh, there are lots of strings attached and lots of limitations and handcuffs to the programs that we're trying to implement and move to closer to a world where we have all of the resources that we need to implement these programs and programs that, and technologies that might come in the future that will help us to prevent crashes and save lives on our roadways. And with that, happy to address any questions. Thank you, Russ. Are there any questions about the state highway safety response to multiple substance impaired driving. Mr. Grando. I won't take a long time, Jonathan, but uh, <laughs> so, yeah. How are, the, how are the state highway safety offices, um, I think right now, addressing multi-substance right now? Is it robust? Is it challenging? Is it on the radar? I mean, what do you see from your perspective uh, from GHSA? I think it's challenging. It's, no, without a doubt, it's challenging. I think all the issues that we talk, we're going to talk about during this meeting are, are issues that most state highway safety offices deal with. They just deal with it in a more comprehensive way. And so I think there are resource limitations. Not every state has access to the same amount of funding or resources to implement these programs. You have some states where they measure their program in the hundreds of thousands, others where it's several million. And that's gonna make a difference in the things that you can do. Um, 
And you have to make tough decisions, like do we want to invest a lot of money to reform our data system, or do we want to implement programs on the roadway that will directly address crashes and prevent crashes? Um, I, I'm glad I'm not in that position, but our, our members certainly are to make those kinds of difficult strategic decisions. Um, and then I think that we're always pushing to get access to more funding, you know, certainly from NHTSA, but from state government as well, to allow us to do these various kinds of things. And we're active on the national level to hopefully unlock a lot of those doors. Questions? Russ told everyone everything they needed to know. <laughs> it's break time. OK. <laughs> um, because this is my show. Um, you know, as you've seen and the challenges from state highway safety offices and maybe the pullback in law enforcement engagement in traffic safety, um, what are some of the messages that JHSA is, is trying to do as far as working with law enforcement, especially around the impaired driving piece, and continuing to keep that as a priority and a focus? Mm -hmm. right, I know that there's lots of issues around just regular traffic stops, but is there some work that's being done along that to help encourage and, and keep those things on the Absolutely. On the yeah, thank you for the question. GHSA has been doing a ton of work on equity over the, certainly over the last year. In fact, it might be one of our top priorities. Um, and we're actually releasing a new report soon with recommendations on uh, what states ought to do to better integrate equity into their highway safety programs. A lot of the ideas and the recommendations are, should, should surprise no one. It's all about community engagement, representation, so thinking about impaired driving. You want to bring representatives from the community in and, and have them have a stake in the things you want to do. If you're, if you're putting together like an impaired driving, uh, a statewide impaired driving strategy or a statewide impaired driving task force, um, thinking about interactions with uh, between like police officers and members of the public, um, there's certainly a lot of reforms that are being discussed just strictly about law enforcement. But I think from a highway safety perspective, there's a growing uh, bit of evidence that when we have problems with equity, it's not related to, I guess, what we would call straight up highway safety enforcement. When there are police officers out there enforcing laws certainly related to impaired driving, speeding, distracted driving, these things that directly threaten the safety of people on the road, we don't see a, a great footprint of uh, disparities in the data when the, the, the data is there to analyze, when we do analyze the data. Rather, it's when, uh, it's when um, highway safety enforcement is used for other kinds of enforcement or as a bridge to other kinds of criminal investigations. So I think one of, our, one of the things that we'd like to talk about is how can, we focus high, how can we focus traffic enforcement on traffic safety? I think if we keep traffic safety as our North Star, um, that's, that's hopefully the best thing we can do. Thank you. Any further questions? Randy, do you have anything from, we have a question over here. Oh, okay. Get the bright lights on me. Hi, I'm Steve Hawkins. I um, am the president of the U.S. Cannabis Council. And my first time being here, we, we've joined NASA because we're very concerned about all the issues that you all are, are speaking of. And I look forward to getting to know many of you. The, the question I have for, for you is um, how can the federal bills that are pending now for comprehensive cannabis reform, the one that's been issued, uh, brought forward by Leader Schumer and, and Booker and Senator Wyden, how can money in that uh, bill and the federal excise taxes that could flow out of it, how could that help in the research that, that you need? Um, in, in, in many ways, cannabis is already uh, become uh, interstate, even though there's a, there's a federal ban precisely because people can uh, ingest cannabis in one state and go to the other, and that, and that impacts all of, all of highway safety. So your thoughts on that? Sure. So, um, so there's a discrete set of programs that are specifically in place to address different aspects of highway safety, but then there's also discussion about legalizing cannabis, and I guess the potential to get revenue generated from that that could be dedicated to whatever we want to dedicate it for. Dedicated to. So certainly, if we are concerned about the impact of marijuana legalization on our roadways, then it's reasonable to think about how some of those funds can be dedicated to meet the needs that we that I discussed and that the speakers before me discussed, and probably what we'll discuss throughout this meeting. We talked about how I, I don't know what an Eliza plate is, but we need them, and there's not enough money for them. So I think that if there was a way to do that, uh, I think it'd be great, and I, we'd be all for it, and we should talk about it. Excellent. We've got time for one more question. 
Anyone have a burning, keeping you up at night kind of concern? Well, if that's, if, if you're all sleeping soundly then, not knowing about some of the State Highway Safety Office uh, approaches, we will certainly uh, let you take a break for the next 20 minutes and return back to the, this room at 3.30. Thank you.